So thank you very much for coming in again and for also turning around another draft in short order. So the committee should have a copy of draft number 2.1 S49, 219, dated 6.22 p.m. Um, and that was the result of um, having sort of a conversations back and forth with various people. I sat down with Mr. Brady and said, okay, based on what we heard yesterday, here's my thought on how we might integrate some of this work and put things together and come up with an next draft and keep moving. So I'll call it a bit of a hybrid between S49 is introduced and information that we got out of the uh, draft that we went through yesterday. With that, I'll stop and I think if you could walk us through and help us see the, uh, if you can do this on the fly, sort of a compare and contrast how we amalgamated the two. Sure. Uh, so on page one, line one, section one, there is a finding section. The alternative language you saw yesterday did not have a finding section. This finding section is based on S49 um, as introduced, it effectively remains the same as S49 until um, page two, line eight, where what you are specifically directing the state to do, or what the state should do, is being changed because the substance of the bill is being changed. Um, you're gonna require a &R to adopt by rule a maximum contaminant level Prior to adoption by rule of that MCL, require public water systems to monitor for certain PFAS chemicals and respond appropriately. When results indicate levels of PFAS in excess of the Vermont Department of Health advisory level, you're going to have ANR adopt a surface water quality standard under their proposal, not the proposal in S49. And then you are going to authorize the agency to require any permitted facility to monitor for any release of chemical that exceeds a health advisory issued by the Vermont Department of Health. That was in the proposed language that you saw yesterday, which I believe ANR supports. There is an additional section that's not noted in the finding section. It is related to reporting back to you regarding the monitoring of the landfill uh, leachate at, I believe, um, the landfill in Coventry, um, and I will get to that when I walk through that section. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, any, so, any questions before we dig in? Yeah. So yesterday there was testimony that uh, from the agency specifically that they did not like the concept of setting an MCL in by statute um, or amending a rule by statute to include an MCL. Um, so instead of setting the MCL and consistent with some language in the alternative language that was given to you yesterday, what the language in front of you today does <coughs> requires um, beginning September 1st, 2019 and every six months until adoption of the rules under section three those rules are the rules for an MCL, which was in the proposed language yesterday, the agency saying that they will adopt an MCL for, for the five noted PFAS chemicals. But until that time, beginning September 1, 2019, and every six months until adoption, all public water systems in the state shall conduct monitoring for the presence of PFAS contaminants in drinking water supply by the system. Now, I define PFAS contaminants for the purposes of this section as those five specific contaminants. I had them not defined, and I was listing all of them whenever PFAS contaminant is used here. It really breaks up the flow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little hard to read, aren't they? I already feel a floor report will be uh, easier to deliver. So, um, but in terms of PFAS, so later on, though, we do get back to talking about the broader range beyond the five. Well, that actually is not in the, the language today. That's something I needed to note for you about whether or not you wanted it, because this is kind of based on that concept of monitoring that was in the proposed language yesterday, but it was, this is just limited to the five. If you want to go broader, you have to reincorporate the language from yesterday 
and I will show you where it is. That was that was me unsure of what you wanted last night when I was drafting. So I left in a subsection where there shouldn't be a subsection to remind me. I'll point it all out. Yeah. To so I mean, I would like it broader. I mean, I know it's so right. again, I think of it, but. And I think my sense is what we're, we're bootstrapping ourselves with the five we know. Right. Saying we know there's, well, potentially thousands more, but testable 33, 34, whatever it is, and then through another test up to maybe 60, so let's start looking more broadly, even if we're only regulating to the five we already have health advisories for. This is my sense of where we were. Okay, thank you. So on page three, line 13, if monitoring, the, the, the interim monitoring uh, indicates presence of any PFAS contaminant individually or in combination in excess of the Vermont Department of Health advisory level, the public water system shall notify the agency of the results. The agency shall direct the public water system to implement treatment or other remedy to reduce the level of PFAS in the drinking water. And I need to check something. Was it 20 parts per trillion? It is 20 parts per trillion. All right. So moving on to page. Can I pause for a minute? So yeah. on that section, um, this in fact story happened, isn't it? In essence, in like Pownall, is it Pownall that has a municipal water supply yeah. that is now being treated for a PFAS reduction to be right. 20 parts per trillion or less? I didn't want to specify, or I didn't think you wanted to specify what the the specific treatment or remedy would be no. because it's going to be, right. I would think, unique to <clears throat> each si system. Um, but I, and I thought the agency was the one that should direct what that should be. Sure. Um, it seems consistent with still relying on rulemaking to do a lot of work that's more detailed. Okay. All right. Um, and then on page four, line one through four. It's a public water system, so you need to say something about providing potable water uh, if it's exceeding that health advisory level. Um, so page four, during treatment or implementation of another remedy to reduce PFAS contaminants in drinking water, the public water system shall provide potable, potable water through other means to all customers and users of the system. Is that not already? Well, well, you're not in the water supply rule right now, right? And the water supply rule that, that that is in certain places, depending on what the contaminant is, et cetera, et cetera. There is there is something of this requirement. Okay. So we'll keep going, and I'm guessing we'll have some comments from Mr. Chapman and Ms. Duckett. Thank you. So, all right, mo moving on, section three. This is the language you saw yesterday in that alternative proposal on or before February 1, 2020, A&R files the final proposed rule with uh, Secretary of State and Alcar to adopt um, an MCL for those five PFAS substances. Uh, then they will have that notice process for um, regulating PFAS uh, under the drink on, on, under the water supply rule as a class or subclasses, and then page five lines three through twelve uh, on or before March one, twenty twenty, they either file that proposed rule or tell you why not. Um, and then the, if they're going to file a proposed rule, it needs to be done by December thirty first, twenty twenty one. Although we have the, the list of five here, um, because it seems like it's such a fast changing world in terms of what may be measured and or regulated, is there a way to say that if in the next year, Department of Health, for instance, finds a sixth that it feels it can define a health advisory for, um, can we open it up so that we keep pace with Involving science, I, I think you could um, you could give the secretary discretion to do that, or you could provide a standard for the secretary to do that. Um, for example, <coughs> a standard would be other PFAS chemicals for which the Department of Health has issued an advisory level in, in that time frame, or um, 
other PFAS that the agency has determined are measurable and should have an MCL, something, you know, I, I, there's, or you just say, or other PFAS chemicals designated by the secretary, you just give them discretion. Well, since we are in active editing, let's pause and do you, do you want to comment just on this issue? Or? Yeah, just, on the, just on this issue while we're going by trying to figure out how to flag it. Well, I mean, I think the agency has the discretion right now to adopt MCLs, and I think that, it, you know, I think that our, our practice, and I think that we would follow it in this instance, is, you know, in, in the future, is that if the Department of Health thought there was sufficient information to establish a health advisory, we would then take that and either um, make it a groundwater enforcement standard or adopt emergency rules making it a groundwater enforcement standard and then we would evaluate the need for adopting an MCL and I think that what we would likely do and I think this bill gives us the authority to do it is we may require a cross-section of sampling to see whether there are issues and if there are issues that would prompt us to move forward the MCL adoption process and if there were immediate threats we would also have the authority to basically require some action be taken in response to those immediate threats while the MCL process is going forward. So that's kind of, I think that this bill gives us all the authority we need and you don't, you don't per se need to do anything <coughs> in addition to that. And uh, why, why one would, and I, I guess I would only say why one would treat PFAS as different than chlorinated solvents or you know other dioxins or other derivative breakdown products is which you would act on which we would act on as well right like these are all things that we sort of evaluate and I think we this bill tells us to evaluate and how we move forward so you're you're laying out a framework sort of guiding the agency on what policy you want us to take with respect to monitoring and moving through contaminants with respect to and I, I guess I guess this is a longer response but I guess if, if we can certainly periodically report back on what we're seeing as a result of the testing that takes place in was it section seven well, I think the, you know, my sense is that while we recognize you have an authority and it may seem a little redundant or something like that um, we're trying to compel the use of that authority to go ahead and set the levels, and given that there's the ability to take a health advisory and turn them into an MCL. With respect, you know, I think I'm, uh, I'm wondering, and some other people are wondering, why we haven't chose to do that. So this is the previous section says, let's, let's wire something in place for the interim, and then let's uh, compel an outcome through rulemaking without tying anyone to some sort of artificial, you know, predetermined outcome. And, and the, this last question is, if we learn more along the way, can we just make sure the language says, please bring this in as well, so we don't find ourselves a year and a half from now saying, too bad we wrote this too narrowly. <laughs> yeah, I would straight. just, I mean, I think that in Section 7, including um, requirements or a standard for when, you know, you ha Section 7 already has the requirement to come back and say, this is how we're going to respond when we have a health advisory and no MCL, um, putting in a standard for when they would move forward. I mean, I think that would be the section that you would add language like that, because I think that it's not just PFAS. If we're trying to get a, it, it would be really where the health department has said there is a, um, we're concerned, we're setting a health advisory. And that could be PFAS or otherwise. Okay, so like this issue for coming back at it more generally in section seven. Um, does that provide you with <coughs> Clarity for editing. Well, I don't think you want any edits yeah. right here, right, right. there. Right. Um, so moving on. Uh, um, 
So I think you're on page five, line 18, section four. This repeals that, that interim testing requirement that's in place beginning September 1st and only six months thereafter until the rule um, is adopted. Should I move on? Um, sorry. Sec 5, page 6, um, this is the language that the that was in the proposed alternative language yesterday about a &R developing surface water quality standards for PFAS that include at a minimum standards for the 5 and uh, PFAS class of compounds or subgroups. And then they have final rule by January of 2024. Okay, thank you. Page six, line 17. This is the language the agency put in about um, having a investigation of potential sources of PFAS Contamination as part of the investigation, they shall evaluate a representative portion of public water systems for the total oxidizable PFAS concentrations. And they shall initiate implementation of the plan no later than July 1 of 2019. <coughs> um, so I, I, the thing I'd like to understand better about I mean, my understanding is that total oxidizable PFAS concentrations testing um, sweeps up the broadest number of PFAS chemicals, but it's not, doesn't deliver specific data. So if part of our goal is to fill in the data gaps, do we need to say anything about like the 537.1 test, you know, as many as many specific PFAS chemicals as possible shall be assessed, as well as then casting the broadest net, even though it's not specific to say what's out there beyond the ones that we can name. I mean, that was my under concept of what we were aiming for, that investigation <coughs> is as revealing as possible. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the things here is that there's no time frame, it's just initiation. Um, so I don't know if you want a time frame. So uh, if there's no real time frame and this is ongoing, that method of testing or, or alternatives to testing might come up and I, do you want to somehow limit the agency on what they're, I'm thinking of 537, 537.1 is supplanted by something, you know, on a reference, right. 537 in here. Um, so I'm probably not the person to ask about what the testing should be or methodology um, or a standard for a evolution of the methodology. I'm not, I'm not I don't know the answers to any of that. Well, Senator, wait, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, we want this broad. We want this. I'm a little confused by the difference. You're talking, Mr. Gray is talking about putting a date in there, but wouldn't this be ongoing? And that's what I guess I'm. Right. So this feels like a section will do some more work on, but I think. Well, that's a question because. It was more a question I was going to raise for you on page seven, line six, about that authority for the agency to, to require any permitted entity to implement conditions. If it's ongoing, it should probably be in statute. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if section six is ongoing, then it should probably be in statute. If you don't want to put that time frame on it, then it should probably be such. Yeah, I mean, if, so I'm thinking aloud about this. I, I was imagining, for instance, that we would 
start this investigation process that would start uh, increasingly filling in the data gaps that we've been talking about. Um, and then we would get some sort of regular updates. The agency would be using that data, we'd be using that data, and just trying to make sure that we keep sort of uh, ratcheting our way up to regulating what we know enough to regulate. Um, so I would think we would need to do some kind of reporting. And then, as you say, it would be ongoing, not, I, I don't, my sense is, unfortunately, we're going to be finding out about these things for many, many years, so I don't, it seem like it would be prudent to have it be an ongoing process. And maybe a series of check-ins, I, I don't know, but I, 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 you're right, I mean, it seems like that. Do six and seven kind of work together? Because you have authority to investigate, right? You get to go out and say there's PFAS contamination, but then under seven, should it be PFAS contamination or any CEC contamination, right? Well, so I think that the thought is is that the agency both plans to do and needs to do an investigation of potential sources of PFAS contamination. And that's, you know, we're going to do that, frankly, whether it's in legislation or not, but having it in legislation is not a bad thing. Um, and that we're going to, I mean, that's sort of the short, short term. It, it's, there's a lot, I mean, I, I keep going back, and this is, I think, in the, to what was, I've said yesterday and the findings, there, there are a lot of sources of PFAS in this state. Um, or potential sources of PFAS in this state. So, you know, I think it's, it's developing a plan to look comprehensively at those sources and sort of go through them bit by bit, source by source, to determine the scope and extent of the, the, the problem. Um, I think that Section 7 gets into how we would do that, um, and, and specifically subsection <coughs> C of Section 7, gets into how we would be looking for that in the broader suite of contaminants. Um, so this is PFAS specific. Um, the other is broader in right. its scope. Right. Can I just, yeah, I just I think it might be helpful to clarify. I think that under section six, there were two, there's two different sets of data collection one is this larger investigation to look at multiple sources. That will be ongoing over time. But the other critical piece that we can do now is test water systems for the maximum number of PFAS. So we had proposed a deadline to have that testing done by July 1st, 2020. And it would be the testing of water systems for the maximum number of PFAS. We're between 35 and 40. And you could draft it you know, basically saying the maximum number using standard laboratory methods, because that does change over time. That data collection, the water system data, is going to be really important um, in order to have that process, that, that public process about whether we regulate as a class or subclass. So having a deadline and requiring public water systems to test for the maximum number by July 1st, 2020 is important because that will feed into that notice process. And that was the subsection that I removed that I didn't know if you wanted because of section two. So I'm going to have a note to myself to reinsert that. Okay, <laughs> then you come to page seven, section seven, that's the interim environmental media standards. Uh, if there's the secretary may require any permanent entity at a facility to um, implement uh, conditions if there's a health advisory has been established for a constituent there. Um, and the secretary determines that their uh, operation of the facility discharge mission or release may result in an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health or the natural environment. And then we have this sunset in here, the next sentence. Well, it's it's really a duration of that yeah. condition. Okay. Um, the 
concept, at least in my opinion, is that the agency will have authority under existing law to um, require a permanent standard or to determine whether or not the, the, there is no longer an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health for the natural environment. Because if, it's very, if, they, if they didn't even do something permanent about it, there was an ongoing problem, they would still have two years, right? Right. If it's if it's a admission from an, an air source, they have ability to respond to that. If it's a hazardous materials release or it's a material that is not a hazardous material, they have the ability to list it and then regulate it. Um, if it's a discharge to waters, the discharge to water authority is very broad. Um, and it's any pollutant, and or any waste, I should say, and so that that would cover it. Um, I really think they have the authority to, under existing law, once they've identified an issue and determined that it's still going to be ongoing and imminent, to, after that two years, use their existing authority to address that issue. I was just going to basically agree with Mike. I mean, you know, this is intended to give the agency the time to go through both an analytical and a public process around listing these emerging contaminants in the various rules that we have that regulate these media sources. So whether it's going to be a criteria pollutant under the, the, the direct discharge program or whether it's going to be a groundwater standard under the groundwater enforcement uh, programs. But it allows us to deal with um, both monitoring and figuring out what the source of the problems are, and then also taking sort of imminent, sort of emergency response efforts to the extent that we've identified something that represents a, a risk, to either human health or the environment. So it's it's basically, it, I mean, it is what it says it is. It's interim authority. It allows us to do things while that more in depth process is pending, so that we're not coming in doing a lot of emergency rules as emerging contaminants are. And Senator Rogers' point is a good point as well, that in two years you have a lot of ability to, to respond legislatively, which you did with PFOA. Um, and so if you really need a response and you want to weigh in with authority or the agency needs authority, you, you have that ability in that two years. And the lines 19 through 21 on 7. Um, those do um, sweep up chemicals of emerging concern, right? It's any contaminant, not just... It's, it's contaminants in drinking water for which a health advisory has been established with no MCL. It's pretty much anything where there's no MCL, so there's maybe 100,000 chemicals, probably. But the, the section is for which a health advisory has been established. Right? Oh, it has been established. Yep. Yeah. That has a Oh, uh, yeah. So we limit ourselves some, a lot. Okay. Okay. Then the new the new section <coughs> that replaces the section in S forty nine about treatment of landfill leachate containing PFAS. Um, it is a directive that A and R shall submit to the General Assembly a report regarding management. At landfills of leachate containing contaminants of emerging concern, the report shall include the findings of the leachate treatment evaluation conducted at any landfill in Vermont, and I believe there's one going on right now, uh, and ANR's assessment of the results of landfill leachate evaluations and ANR's recommendations for treatment of CECs and leachate from landfills, including whether the state should establish a pilot project to test methods for testing or managing CECs and landfill leachate. So this was a change from the 6605 yesterday. From the the uh, the alternative the language. Alternative language. Yes, yes. Yes. So because and just I don't know if everyone in the committee is aware. Of, my understanding is that as part of the permit issued for the uh, Coventry landfill, there's a requirement for. Um, Casella to lead an independent investigation mm -hmm. of methods to treat leachate from the landfill. So there's at least that investigation going on. I don't know if there are others, Mr. Chapman. No, not. Okay. Um, 
And as people Chris. pointed out, the, I'm sorry, Senator Rogers. Um, so in sub two, the agency natural resources assessment of the results, would that mean they would be telling us was what was in that leachate? What is the assessment of the results? I think it's really um, ANRs, and I passed this by a couple of ANR people, and um, and maybe what they're <coughs> intuiting they will be doing, but uh, it. I think they're going to get those findings back. They're going to look at those findings and see whether or not that, that they consider it the findings to have a show a concern, show an issue, uh, something that needs to be addressed, etc. Um, and I'd recommend. I guess I'm just wondering. There's no direction in there for what they're supposed to be looking. Or, so I guess I'd like to hear from the agency exactly what they're looking for. Is it broad spectrum? Are they looking for everything? Are they looking for certain things? <coughs> How would the agency look at that? So the requirement right now is for the landfill to evaluate um, on-site and off-site treatment options for treating leachate. So it's not a chemical specific, but rather a treatment specific analysis that we've asked them to look into, to look, basically look at, with a focus on PFAS, but, but in all honesty, how you treat PFAS is likely going to pick up, how you, com the, the sort of common treatment techniques are going to pick up a lot more than just PFAS when you treat landfill leachate. Um, so we're not testing it? Oh, we're, we're testing. You're testing what There's, is uh, coming out of the pipe after whatever well, process they're putting it through? So there's, so this is a, this is sort of a feasibility scale analysis of treatment. So I think there's a number of things there. We already test, there's a number of on-site monitoring wells, there's testing of the leachate and there's testing at the wastewater treatment facility. So there's testing that takes place as far as sampling for results at all of those, in all of those areas. Um, what this particular analysis is, is an evaluation of all alternatives with respect to treatment of landfill EHA for CECs um, at, the, at the site and then frankly off-site as well. I guess what I'm getting at is if we're testing to see if there's gold in the effluent and we say, nope, no gold, it's good to go. What else is there? Not being tested for that's there. That's, that's what I'm wondering and how do we get at a broad spectrum test so we know exactly what is there and what is coming out in the treatment and what isn't and is going back into the surface water. And I guess that's my concern. Uh, I don't know that in terms of the, the permit and the testing paradigm that it requires, can, can you, does it address Senator Rogers' concern about being broad spectrum? Um, well, the permit requires testing over a suite of contaminants. <coughs> Uh, you know, I think I, I'm interpreting Senator Rogers' question of trying to identify the unknowns in, in basically, and I think I, I would need to talk with folks who, who have a deeper understanding of this than I do, mm -hmm. Senator, to actually and, respond. And deeper than I do as well. Fair enough. I mean, and to try and get to that. I mean, that's, I think that's the, any of these complex media like landfills or wastewater treatment plants have a number of different things going on in them and it's hard to sort of isolate um, even through a broad sort of testing like what it is that we're dealing with and you know I don't want to get in because I'm certainly not the expert on you know chemistry and how a chemist interprets the analytical methods coming out of the machine but it, they're very these are very sort of complex uh, matrices to see things in. So I would need to talk to people about whether, how they screen and what sort of screening techniques are used. I know that we do some, whether it identifies everything. I mean, I think 
the fair represent. I mean, my fair response would be it probably doesn't. Right, right. and that's you know. so. My my concern is, do we know enough about the unknowns right now, yep. and should we be looking closer and figure out the unknowns that are that are flowing out to the surface waters? And I'll get your response. Back. Thank you. Um, we're going to be coming back to this bill on Friday, so if that's something you can look into between now and then, um, that'd be great. So should I note what I'm going to mark up? Uh, yes, please. Um, so I'm going to put it in a committee amendment format, because right now it is not. Okay. Um, I am going well, to... Pause. Anyone in the committee not want to put this into a committee amendment to the underlying bill? And on page seven, I'm reinserting the subsection B regarding the testing for all compounds. Um, and that's really it. Okay. Um, one question that came up, I mean, we've talked about it. It's gone back and forth. There'll be section five, page six, on or before January 1, 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say... We, my sense of the committee is that we're we're looking to do something sooner than five years out. Uh, the sense of what I've heard from each yeah, natural sure. resources yeah. so far is that it's a lot of work. Um, I, you know, there was a an EPA action plan on PFAS that is deliver. They're delivering a. Re Results, I think, in 2021. Is that correct? Yeah, they are going to determine if available data and research support the development of Clean Water Act Section 304 ambient water quality criteria by 2021. So one thing we discussed yesterday, mine is still marked up this way, was to go to 2022 to give agency a year to use that information as part of its own work. Um, Senator King. So I'm just looking over there. Uh, Matt, Mr. Chairman, so you were the one who raised the concern that mm -hmm. in the time frame that we gave yesterday, it was almost, you could get it done almost under the wire, not exactly, but if it was more realistic, this you just feel. So my reading of that is that EPA is going to look at the existing data to see whether they do anything, not that they're actually going to do anything. And this has been kind of the way that we've seen EPA respond mm -hmm. to PFAS. They do studies to see whether there are additional studies that are necessary. Um, well, that's exactly their purpose. They said that the purpose, when adopted by states and tribes as water quality standards, criteria can be used to set permit limits on discharges to a water body and determine if a water body requires cleanup. Right. So my reading of that is, is that they're going to look at existing data to see whether they move forward, not actually moving forward, which means that they'll have basically what we're proposing to do by 2020 in concert with the rest of New England done by 2021, and then if they don't have a time frame on how long it's going to take to actually develop the standard itself. And I don't think the existing information out there allows us to just take existing data and develop a standard. Frankly, that's what we'll be looking at over the next, roughly speaking, year to see how long it's going to take for us, what, you know, what the extent of existing data is. Isn't that what you do with a lot of things that aren't federally mandated? It's like look at the existing data. Right. I mean, I, I guess my, again, Mike, I guess my reaction is, is if, if I think we can look at the existing data and say there's insufficient data to develop a standard. The 2024 data is to adopt a standard, which means actually going out and doing the work with New England, the other New England states, to gather the data to adopt a standard. And if what you do is you set a deadline by uh, 2021 or two for us to do it, I, mean, I suppose you can set the deadline. The agency will not have gotten the information together. I, mean, I just will tell you that right now. It will be another legislative deadline the agency fails to meet. Um, well, is there a, uh, another choice, like the agency said, in order to meet this deadline, we would need the following resources? I, well, that, that, frankly, is what the plan is intended to do by next year, is to tell us what the state of the existing data is and what the needs are in order to get us there. And we think that it's going to go faster if we're working collaboratively in, with other New England states than trying to do it in isolation by ourselves. 
is uh, I think this committee's habit has not been to put the deadlines in that we heard that someone can't meet. Right? We're trying to be practical. On the other hand, five years out for uh, um, it is it's such a long time. But, uh, yeah, I'd rather personally, so I'll speak personally, I'd rather stick with a closer date and then ask A&R to come back with, if they feel like, hey, we see 2022, two years off, we're not gonna make that, we need additional resources to make it, then, it, then that to me seems like an appropriate pushback to say the legislature either needs to put the money into the program or we, have, we should be moving the date. I'd like Sears to see this and he's no kid. Five years, six years, who knows, right? <laughs> and already's gonna be running that committee till like 2040. <laughs> <laughs> this contract says 2030 for right? <laughs> negotiations. Uh, well, what's the committee sense? I'd rather sort of. Uh, I, I agree, let's push it up. So 2022 is a right. year beyond the EPA work. It also means there's three years for work to be done and have that dialogue with the agency. When we can outbreak. Right. Is there a parent? I'm fine moving it up. Okay. So we'll go to 2022. We need to ante up? Well, we'll, we'll figure that out along the way. Right. Um, uh, so, Thank you for that walkthrough and all that back and forth. I don't know, but we haven't, we've done point by point. Mr. Chapman, do you want to uh, join us at the table and talk about this construct as amended more broadly? We may have missed stuff that you want to comment on. I would love to. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Sears is GP, 2022 is fine. <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning Good again. Home. So for the record, Matt Chapman, General Counsel of the Agency of Natural Resources. I, I'm just gonna go through sort of um, comment by comment, um, starting with section one. Um, I think that our, our proposal or suggestion would be that uh, on line six, um, after PFAS may enter the environment. I would I would say, from numerous industrial or commercial sources, including from emissions during a manufacturing process, from disposal of goods. I I just think it's important for everyone to have an appreciation of the scope of the problem that's there, and this appears to be more limiting than it is in fact. Um, um, my next comment. I'm sorry. Would you say that? One sure. Um, so PFAS may enter yeah. the, the yeah. environment from a number of industrial and commercial sources, including when emitted, I mean, you can use, it's just making it fit into the. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, are you catching this? Yep. Thank you. Um, I, we would strongly recommend deleting subdivision four. I don't believe it to be factually accurate. Um, more research is needed. More research is needed. Um, well, it's it's not accurate with respect to exposure to PFASs. I mean, there are a number of PFASs that we do have sufficient information to determine the health effects on humans from exposure to low, low levels in the environment. So, so are, you, are you citing line 12? I am, I am 12, to yes, 12 to 18. And can you say again, I'm not sh sure what you find inaccurate. Uh, the agency has sufficient information to determine the health effects to humans from exposure of low levels of environmental exposure to PFOA, PFOS, PF, HXA, PF. Um, there are a number of them, so this is this is not it, it's speaking to the class of PFOS broadly and making it an accurate finding in the agency's opinion. They already know that it causes. Maybe. We know that it causes it, it, exactly the. the we, don't say more, we don't need to say more research is needed. To right, and and I think that that may lead people who would like to say that the science is uncertain to use this as affirmation that the science is uncertain when in fact it's not. We know that there are adverse health effects that come from PFOA and PFOS and other 
contaminants, and I, I, it, it's unhelpful to have a legislative finding that says this. I'm okay with yanking that. Yeah. Okay, how about the assertion part of this? The, 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 the assertion part is that there are health effects from low levels of exposure to PFAS, including well, and, and I think again, this goes back to you know the statement I made yesterday, and is that you, not all PFAS are created equally, and the level of, of information that we have varies dependent on what we're talking about. So I don't think you can make this statement as it relates to PFAS. And the agency believes for the five contaminants that we've set standards for, we have sufficient information to determine that they have adverse health impacts. Um, um, I mean, personally, this isn't where I want to. Battle. Yeah. You know, this is. Uh, I'm comfortable with removing that. Personally. Uh, I, I don't know if it was intended to, to create a groundwork for the investigation language that comes later. Or not. I I appreciate. I just think that it's not accurate and that it's not helpful to the state generally. Right. Um, Thank you. So. Does it make sense to have uh, Ms. Duggan weigh in a little bit as we go along, or no? Just to have this conversation, or no? no? I was also. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you for keeping the clock. So yes, if you, don't be shy. I I and would we, just and say we're going to be coming back to this. So yeah. it would be great if you can. I will, I will be sort of quick. I mean, I think that I agree with the recommendation to make sure that we're accurately characterizing the scope of the problem. So broadening it, as um, Mr. Chapman suggested, and finding two. And then for finding four, um, I agree that you know I, we're fine striking it um, because we certainly don't want to suggest that we don't have sufficient information where we do. Yeah. So the next comment that I have is in section on the, let's see, page three, section two, um, subsection C on line 13. Mm -hmm. And the recommendation is at the beginning of on line 13 to basically state that after the secretary confirms that monitoring results under B of this section, um, exceed the Vermont Health Advisory of 20 parts per trillion individually or in combination, and then strike to the agency shall direct. So again, I think that we need to make sure that we're, it's not just any time there's a monitoring result, but there's, there's confirmation from monitoring that we have a problem. Um, and then, uh, then we should just move to directing uh, the system to put treatment on at that point. Yeah, and I'm happy I, I have to share. No um, my next sort of comment with respect to um, subsection, subsection D is I think that it should just, it, it should probably be clarified. Um, I, I, the way I read re the, the testimony around this um, seemed to imply that during the period of time between the confirmatory sample and treat the installation of treatment that some alternate source of water would need to be provided to users, that that's the intent. My initial reading of this was that during treatment um, that you were required to provide an alternate source of water, which is my reading was potentially post installation. So I think it's more of a clarifying as opposed to. Uh, okay. Mr. Obey, you're keeping up with and I can send my, I wrote my comments. Specific language, I think we're short on time a little bit, but if you can send language and then I'll sit down and we'll do passionate things out. I'm just all right on this one. Thank you. Um, the next comment is with respect to the Same page. No, now I'm in section five on page six. In, in subsection A, subdivision specifically subdivision two, where it says that the minimum, at a minimum, the proposal shall have standards for PFAS class of compounds or subgroups. It's just not clear to me what this means in the context of the minimum standard. I mean, I feel fairly confident that we'll be able to come up with criteria for the five PFAS compounds. It's not clear to me whether this is directing us to examine 
like technology-based effluent limitations for purposes of, of um, discharges or whether this is looking at the sort of class and whether if we are looking at class, is that a required minimum or is it just an analysis? So I, I would look to- Greater specificity. For greater specificity and clarity on that one. Um, I'm not saying, but I, and I'm happy to work with council yeah. to try and just figure out what, and, and the committee to figure out what the intent is there. So they're, they're anded, right? So. They're anded and they're minimum requirements. And if it were if it were not at a minimum, I, I think that if what you're asking us to do is to look at a class, then I think I understand that and we're willing to do it. Um, but I think the at a minimum makes me think that I'm required to develop a class and I'm not sure that we'll be able, how we would approach that in this context. Um, we need more time than 2022. Yeah, I mean, I think that what you know, what we would want to see from, from the agency is a plan for both the five, but then also a proposal for how they would deal with the class or subclass for surface water standards as well. So I think that's what we would want to see from the, from the agency to make sure that we're, the agency is continuing to evaluate how we are moving towards a class or subclass approach. So if, if one were to do that and mirror it off what takes place for drinking water, where we basically initiate a process to look at a class of contaminants as opposed to, again, my reading of this is that it's a mandate to do a standard at a minimum to cover the class of contaminants. So I, I just raised to that. I'm not so if either of you have more specific tweaks to that one, you can send them on to the surveying the outlet yep. in the loop and so the next comment I have is with respect to section six um, on page seven lines one through three the agency continues to have significant concerns with testing for total oxidizable PFAS um, we don't think it is reliable reckless replicable or is going to give us any actionable information and we're concerned that based on what people have reviewed there we're going to get we're going to show detections where there's there's not any detection there i'm sorry what line is that um it's on page seven yep it's it's basically the requirement for all uh it's lines one through three okay thank on you. the total oxygen oh, yes okay yeah so for now i would say let's leave it and I'd like to circulate information that Ms. Douglas provided earlier today, I think I first saw it. And could you just say something to characterize what that was? Yeah, I mean, I think that our, the, the State of Michigan Science Advisory Council did evaluate um, a number of different analytical methods um, for trying to close the mass balance for PFAS and looking at PFAS as a class. And the top assay was one of the um, test methods that they ultimately recommended using as part of the state's suite of investigation tools. Um, so we'll get that information to you. Or not we've, to we've actually seen it, and, and again, you know, the, the document states that it's, Michigan's found that it's useful when designing and evaluating remedial systems, which we don't disagree with. This is not for a remedial system, this is for site characterization, and we don't think that this is an appropriate tool to use in the context of site characterization. This is effectively what you're asking is us to, to use it in a characterization process, which we don't think is appropriate. Okay. So let's hold on to this question for now and sort it out. Um, but I think the importance in my mind of leaving it for the time being is that it is our broadest tool, and that we're, and so we'll debate how appropriate to tool is as we keep going. Thank you. And, and that's, the, that's the extent of the agency's comments. Which is okay. So we're at noon, but I'd ask people to stay for another minute. If it's, like, you've been weighing in as we went. Do you have any other comments that didn't get caught up already? The only other very small comment that we haven't talked about is um, in the finding section, um, page two. Oh, no, wait, sorry. Um, uh, page two, line eight. Um, this is sort of similar to the comment that we actually already have documented risk 
from certain PFAS, we would just recommend striking the precautionary approach because we don't want to, you know, I don't think that we want to suggest that moving forward with the investigation and regulation is based on a lack of knowledge, like there is documented risk. And so we would recommend striking that first clause and then just saying to prevent further contamination of state waters from PFAS and to reduce the potential harmful effects. Okay. Um, any, any more objections to that? So thank you very much for staying a little late and working through. Um,